Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kate Brown. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Island Partnership. Um, and I really wanted to thank everyone for um, taking the time, both our speakers, <clears throat> and we have a really um, awesome lineup of speakers, but also those of you who are able to attend. Um, I'm going to just give some brief opening remarks. So one thing, this is an event um, organized by the Global Island Partnership, along with some of our members and partners. Um, and just in reflection, the Global Island Partnership was founded um, out of a Convention on Biodiversity process related to the development of a program of work on island biodiversity. So we're very, um, have been previously very focused on the Convention on Biodiversity. And we were actually a decision um, in in COPS in 2006, 2008, and 2012 um, as a mechanism to implement, uh, to support implementation of the convention in islands. I think uh, our two speakers that we have coming up, um, one on the climate COP outcomes in an island context and one focused on that coming out of the CBD, are going to give us some really amazing insights into that. We've um, work together for a really long time um, and we're excited to hear their perspectives on what what we need to know and then what we can how we can engage with each other moving forward. and the second part of this um, webinar will focus on some examples of implementation we're always been focused in GLISPR on implementation so we'll give some examples of island oriented implementation from some of our members and partners um, and we also want to really recognize all of the work and advocacy of islands for a really long time around the world to keep island issues at the forefront of um, these global um, discussions. So without further ado, I'd like to pass to Paula to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Keith. We now have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Spencer Palmer. We need a special envoy for multilateral environmental agreements. Spencer is the island's lead negotiator for climate change and biodiversity. He is a former financial secretary and economic policy advisor in the Ministry of Finance in Grenada. He has served on the Bureau of the Convention of Biodiversity and as chairman of the subsidiary body for scientific, technical and technological advice. He's a GLISPA board member and has also served as a regional counselor of IUCN. Dr. Thomas has over 25 years of experience in the area of biodiversity and diplomacy. And now pass the floor to him. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for this generous introduction. And good day to everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to begin a few reflections on the outcome of COP27. Now, I will begin by just saying that prior to COP27, um, this COP was dubbed an African COP. It was also dubbed an African COP because it was happening in Africa. It was dubbed also an adaptation COP because many felt that they need to have a balance between mitigation and adaptation. And it is time that adaptation and building resilience is for states and vulnerable states become a priority. And there were also indications that this COP, COP27, should be an implementation COP based on action and implementation action. So, an AOC, the Small Island Developing States, their positions going into the COP27 was that that COP should be an implementation COP because we already know what needs to be done to keep global warming at safe levels. But just prior to the COP, the UN Secretary General made some pronouncement at the high level statement, which I thought was very useful and important for us to, to take as the backdrop. He said that we are on a highway to climate hell and our foot is on the accelerator. This is a, a real statement made just prior to the COP. And he went on to say that we have two choices. Is either we do something and make sure that we have climate solidarity pact coming out of COP27, or we will have collective suicide pact. And that tells us what, how we need to review the outcome of COP27 in light with our statement, and what are the opportunities missed 
from uh, what are the issues that we have raised as far as small island states are concerned. So I will start by saying that in a nutshell, small island states had about six key priorities going into the COP. The first one, of course, was having concrete outcomes on loss and damage. The issue of mitigation was critical and also to ensure that we limit global warming to 1.5. And now that we, again, we, based on the science that we have, and we just have AR6 coming out, which reinforces all of these key messages. We also needed enhanced ambitious adaptation action. And of course, finance, finance for technology, finance for capacity building, finance for adaptation, and of course, finance for the climate agenda. Another key priority for us, the fifth priority was the global stop take and to ensure that we made a significant contribution to advancing the work of the global stop take. And of course, for small island developing states, the issue of the preservation of special circumstances and unique vulnerabilities of small states need to be critical in the negotiation. So these are the six priorities I felt we could review the COP based on the outcomes that we have already indicated. Now, of course, seeds will have other priorities. Of course, like um, agriculture, oceans, equity, just transition, um, alignment with the SDGs, they're all priorities. But I think I would just want to focus on those given the 10 minutes that we have. In terms of loss and damage, again, we have some clear priorities that have been identified going into COP by, by, by small island developing states, among which is the loss and damage response fund, ensuring that we have we move away from just top to something concrete and with that it is operationalized and so on. What we got out of COP, of course, we got the loss and damage facility, which was critical. We got a transition committee form to, to determine the way forward and the modalities and scope and everything. And we had some issues relating to the Santiago network being agreed. And the issue of the WIM governance um, was postponed to a later date. When we look at this outcome generally, we will see that our foot is slightly off the accelerator. We have taken some advantage of, 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 of opportunities that were available here because it took 31 years for us to move from a concept of loss and damage to actually establishing the fund of loss and damage. So the foot on this particular issue, I will say to the Secretary General that the foot was slightly off the accelerator. But how, how, how are we done on the other five priorities? The next, um, the next um, slide, of course, we will speak to. The next slide, please. Mitigation priorities. And these are the priorities here we had for the mitigation. The focus, of course, was on 1.5 with no overshoot. The issue of picking, the issue of the NDCs being aligned to the mitigation target. Clear issues relating to fossil fuel and coal phase out, the methane pledge, and of course, ecosystem based action. Ecosystem based action, critical for small states also. How did we do? Again, I will say the foot remained on the accelerator with respect to mitigation because we did not make significant progress. Um, we had limited progress made, and to a large extent, there were some efforts to renege on previously agreed positions in terms of mitigation action. So the foot was on the accelerator and we are towards the climate hell on this particular issue with respect to the Secretary General pronouncement. So the next slide speaks to the next key priority, priority number three, which is adaptation. And of course, small island states went in with very clear issues on adaptation, making sure that we have a global framework on adaptation making sure that we have scaled up adaptation finance and, 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 and so on to push the adaptation and building resilience agenda. How do we do? We got our program, of course, um, but slow progress have been made on finance. Again, we have a diluted adaptation issues here. So again, we have significant gap remain and our foot is still on the accelerator uh, as far as this issue is concerned on adaptation priorities. For, although we made some progress, but the progress was clearly limited. So the next issue had to do with finance. And where were we? What are we asking for? Of course, scale up climate finance to achieve all the targets, ensuring that we had the 100 billion goal, adequate financing, 
and for technology development and transfer and capacity building and so on. These were some of our priorities. What did we get out of it? Again, we get another work program, a work program. So work program has been quite sexy in, in the climate debate because we're getting work program for everything. But is that enough? And how does that go with respect to implementation? And we again on the climate finance priority, we believe that the foot is still on the accelerator to climate health. The next priority for us has to do with the global stock tick. And of course, this is an issue which we need to take particular attention on it because the global stock tick will be the mechanism for achieving the ambition, the climate ambition that we have over the, the short to long, medium term, starting in 2023 and of course every five years afterwards. And we believe that this will be a significant issue to have a check on our activities as we go forward to make sure that we keep within the climate safe space. How do we do? Again, we agree and, and, and basically our program in a way to move the process to the next level. The next priority agenda item is the special circumstances of small island states. We believe this is critical. It has been embedded in the convention and we need to protect this because everything that we do has to deal with the issue of um, our special circumstances and unique vulnerability as small island states. How do we do on this? Well, no decision, no progress was made, but no decision was made to, to reverse the special circumstances of small island states. There were other um, parties and other regions that were, were also putting forward um, arguments for to, to be special circumstances for Africa, for instance, and other countries. This didn't um, go down in the negotiation very well for the moment. So that was part for the moment. So this issue of special circumstances for small states remains on the agenda as far as we are concerned. So the next slide. The next slide speaks to other outcomes which I indicated already. We have issues on work program and just transition, work program and agriculture, um, the centrality of climate finance with the, with the with the whole question of AR6 report coming out and, and Article 6 architecture. All of these were or part of the, of, the, of the debate, and especially oceans. So as we say, and generally, we believe that we have made some progress, minor progress, but the bulk of the issues still remain to be decided. So the next slide, which I will speak to, has to do with how do we go forward? What we look forward? What is the challenge that we have going forward? We believe that global inflation and supply chain disruptions will continue to, 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 to linger. Um, we will have also the lingering COVID-19. Global conflicts will also continue to, to be on the horizon for 2020, for COP28. Food and energy insecurity um, against the backdrop of big oil profits. We just heard Aramco, $161 billion profit in one year. And all the other oil companies, the billions of dollars that they are raking in and at the same time, we have significant issues with respect to financing for climate, ad climate adaptation, and climate action. We again have to re recognize we are into an economic and debt crisis situation. And then the next COP will be in UAE, where there is a presidency that, well, of course, there is an affinity for, for fossil fuel and that side of, of, of the planet. So we, the issue of phasing out of fossil fuel, coal and, and, and fossil fuel and so on will also be issues. There will be some very contentious issues at COP28, which will be like the technical issues on, on Article 6. Finance will continue um, picking, freezing out the uh, fossil fuel, the whole question of loss and damage and compensation. All of these will be very typical contentious issues for COP28. So COP28 will be quite challenging in the fact that we have already missed some opportunities at COP27 to deal with some of these issues here. So the next slide um, speaks to what should be our focus going forward as small island developing states in COP28. Of course, the operationalization of the loss and damage fund and the work of the transition committee will be critical. Of course, we need to accelerate climate mitigation action to align with 1.5, and I think we need to continue to advocate for those positions. They complete the work on the global goal and adaptation to build a resilience in our economies. 
And of course, the climate finance targets and to clarify issues relating to climate finance and the other very technical issues that are, 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 are in the negotiation. And to conclude the global topic with integrity to meet the objectives. And of course, again, to preserve the special circumstances of small island states. I think so these are some of the key um, considerations that small island states should be taking into the COP at the end of this year. And my final slide, I think, will speak, final slide, what we should take away um, from, this, from this. We believe that from COP27, the unity of small island development states mattered, and that we have to continue to influence the outcome. Um, seeds have been known to be classified as the concept, as the of, of the of the um, the conscience of the negotiation, and I think we need to continue that as small states. Now, I believe it is also important that some issues be ventilated among small states very clearly. The issue of liability and compensation, the question of the loss and damage fund, and so on. I think we need to really have our heads strong in one part on this, in this issue. The critical issue of the precautionary principle has to be something that I think we need to take into the COP very seriously. There were issues relating to um, um, solar radiation modification, issues relating to ocean um, issues, um, all the different mining in the seabeds and so on. All of these issues, and I think we need to really bring in the question of the precautionary put front and center in this deliberation. And, and ask for the moratorium on these issues. I believe it is also important for us as small states to focus on fossil fuel phase out and the oceans issue. I think these critical issues, we need to have a very clear and firm position and a united position on those issues. Carbon market development, again, and the capacity required for small states to actively participate in carbon market issues should be something that we need to look at. And I believe finally, my final slide is that we need to be conscious of the impact that we make in the climate change negotiations, impact on other conventions, in particular the, 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 the Convention on Biodiversity, which we will hear a lot about next presentation. And of course, the complete linkage with the MDGs to ensure that what we do in one convention do not adversely impact on the achievement of the objectives of other similarly related conventions like the Biodiversity Convention and the MDGs. So I want to stop here. I hope I didn't take too much of the 10 minutes that I was allotted. But in a nutshell, I will say that we have missed a golden opportunity in COP27, and we need to put our act together so that small states will be able to influence the outcome of COP28. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer, for providing such rich information and for expertly summarizing the outcomes and challenges of um, COP27, and also for providing your perspective on the way forward. You have certainly set the tone, and I look forward to our Q&A session where our participants get to delve a little bit deeper into this topic. Okay. It is now, we now welcome our next speaker, Mary May Jeremy, who is the CEO of the Seychelles Conservation and Adapt. Climate Adaptation Trust. She will provide us with reflections on the CDB COP15. Mary May holds a Master of Environment degree from the University of Melbourne. In the course of her career, she has held several senior positions in the government of Seychelles and has served on many boards in the environment, conservation, and resource management sectors. Before joining SECAT, Mary May served as the Director General for Biodiversity Conservation and Management Division of the Ministry of Agriculture, Climate Change, and Environment where she focused on biodiversity policy. She served as lead, as policy lead for ocean government initiatives, including the Seychelles Marine Spatial Plan. Floor is now yours, um, Marini. Thank you, um, Paula. Let me just quickly bring on my screen. Okay. I hope that is um, okay. So good evening and uh, good time of the day to um, all colleagues and participants attending the webinar um, today. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor for me to be here and I thank Liz Pye and all of the partners for, 
for extending the invitation to um, to me. Um, it's always a pleasure also to see some familiar faces and names um, in the participants list. So this evening I've been tasked to provide some reflections on the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties um, to the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, also now being called the Kunming Montreal COP, which took place in Montreal from the 5th to the 19th of December 2022. So yes, I um, I address the, um, in multiple capacities today, um, of course, as the CEO of SECAD, but um, and also having been Seychelles National Focal Point for CBD for the past 10 years, um, and also um, a CBD Substar Bureau member current. So in my, um, in my short presentation, I hope to touch a little bit on the significance of the Kunming Montreal COP, um, focusing a little bit on some of the outcomes, and then um, also then reflecting on how these outcomes will um, affect implementations for islands and finally just some key messages from the process um, as we look forward. So the, the CBD um, COP15, um, when it concluded, it had the adoption of what we're calling the landmark conclusion for the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And it also had many other important decisions underpinning the implementation of this global agreement. Um, whilst there's so many um, broad goals and targets, but I think as a whole, there was a lot of expectations um, for the COP. Um, so why was it so important? Um, when, we, when we were finishing um, the IG biodiversity targets or the CBD strategic plan 2011, 2020, um, everybody was sort of um, hopeful that the um, implementation levels that we had seen under the IG targets would become better. And so therefore we needed to find uh, an approach that would be transformative that would help us to address the drivers of loss that had been identified under the Global um, Biodiversity Assessment Report that had been done by EBES, and also to build on the, um, the status of implementation that had been reported upon by parties in their six um, national CBD reports. And so the magnitude of the challenge for biodiversity loss that we were posed with towards the, the beginning of 2020 when we knew we had to start working on the framework was how do we make it transformative? How do we make it um, a, whole of, a whole of society that includes private sector, that identifies ways of bringing in resources to help implementation that would really halt and reverse biodiversity loss? So the process itself, um, as you know, we had planned to have so we had the mandate that had been provided to us by the um, COP14 in Sharm el Sheikh to set out the, the three um, sort of pathway for the framework. We had our two um, co-chairs, we had the negotiation sessions that had been set up, but as you know, this, this did not happen um, as it had been program programmed. Instead, we ended up have, having five open-ended working group sessions multiple virtual sessions, including SABS to 24 and SBI, which, which um, happened um, in 2020, 2021. But what it did, however, it did set out a clear mandate for what we all aspired the framework to be. We really all wanted to have a framework that would guide implementation of the convention to provide clarity, to be transformative, inclusive, timely, timely in the sense that it would help us to catch up with lost time that we had lost, of course, to COVID, and also at the same time to push for the urgency for action. And of course, I guess for um, all of us, a mechanism to halt and reverse global biodiversity loss. So as SIDS going into the, um, the COP15, even if we do not have like an official platform similar to the um, the one that, you know, um, Spencer was just talking about under the UNFCCC, going into um, the CBD um, negotiations in Montreal, we all really aspired to have a framework that was responsive to the needs of SIDS, that recognized ocean issues, that gave enough 
um, recognition to um, the small circumstances of SIDS, particularly as it relates to capacity building, as it relates to benefit sharing, and especially those discussions that were centered around digital sequence information and the capacities of SIDS to actually be part of this conversation. So the main outcomes um, of the CBD COP15, of course, um, we have the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that was adopted, the landmark framework that was adopted on the 19th of December. Um, the framework itself, it has four goals, which highlights the three core objectives of the convention and the means of implementation. Um, there are 23 targets um, that were painstakingly <laughs> negotiated. Um, which ranges from the 30 by 30 protection goal that touches on financial requirements, that speaks to the level of engagement, that speaks to ecological connectivity. Um, and also we have several targets um, that touches more broadly um, around the way we are going to sustainably use, but also restore degraded lands in a degraded lands and seascapes in order to um, help restore or reverse the um, extent of biodiversity loss that we have. Um, but also the COP took decisions on other sub-stein SBI matters, including conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, which was, someone, uh, which was something that we really fought for as islands um, at, the, at the CBD COP15. But what does all of this mean um, for islands? The important targets that are in response to our priorities, of course, we have, like I mentioned, the ones that are related to benefit sharing. So the SI did eventually end up um, being part of the um, framework, although there's still quite a bit of work that needs to happen thereafter. But generally, um, the, the ability of SIDS to be part of the discussions were very minimal. We had very strong support, of course, from from the African group, but uh, as a whole, um, even from a developing country um, level, we had very, very strong issues of capacity to engage on some of those really, really technical um, matters at the CBD COP15. And also because of the lack of a formal um, grouping or a negotiating block under the CBD, which I think has been one of the key things that Galispa over the years have tried really, really hard to make sure that we have that, but we still do not have that, the ability to negotiate the seeds. While we, st we, we did get some support to, um, to put forth some general statements, but we did not have the level of organization that would suffice in order for us to put across really, really strong seeds related um, positions. We have a 30 by um, 30 protection target also, which was lobbied quite extensively um, by all SIDS. And this transcends across other multilateral environmental mechanisms, um, including of course now the, the BBNJ and also um, other international um, processes. We also tried to fight extremely hard for special circumstances of SIDS. And I resonate with Spencer when he says that, yes, we did and get some, some reluctance or some uh, rejections for, from some of the other, even other developing countries that uh, were of the view that, you know, SID should not have special circumstances, especially when it comes to conservation, um, to conversations around resource mobilization. And this is a battle that we will still have to continue. And as we look forward towards implementation, these are some of the key gaps that as SIDS, I think we have to focus on. Under the um, Sabster items, we had one on marine and coastal biodiversity. And this one is, is quite a critical one because as part of the decisions that have been taken by the COP, um, there has been a request for the Secretariat to undertake a, a review, a strategy preview of the um, program of work on island biodiversity, which I know Kate spoke of um, at the very beginning, that GLISPA was instrumental in, in establishing um, in the formidable years of the, of the convention. So it is the intent, and I think the push for us during the negotiations was that since marine and coastal biodiversity issues were not given or not addressed 
in the same manner that we would have loved in order to give islands um, a bit of a, a leg up in terms of the implementation of the framework, we thought that this would be a critical, critical space for us to have. And we insisted on language. And in fact, it is us SEEDS that provided the language um, that has now appeared in the decision related to program of work on island biodiversity. And it is our hope that we are going to be able to capitalize on this review and ensure that there are some critical entry points into how islands, especially SIDS, are going to be able to implement the new framework. So just my last slide, really, um, implications and key messages for implementation of islands. And um, here in this slide, I've just um, provided some general reflections as to the best way in which um, as islands, we will be able to organize ourselves, build the necessary capacities within country and also at the regional and, um, and, at, and at the SIDS level in order for us to best um, get the best out of the um, global biodiversity framework. One critical thing around resource mobilization is that the new framework creates an opportunity for working with private sector. Um, because we have taken a whole of society approach um, in, in the new framework. So there is scope for us to continue to explore innovating financial mechanisms. Here, um, looking at blended finance and finding a way to ensure that we have available resources that is coming back down for implementation. Whilst the new global diversity framework, it's, it's better and it's clearer in the sense that it's more measurable than the IG targets that we had before, it is a lot more complex. So it is quite ambitious and it actually is going to bring a lot of implementation burden on us as SIDS. So therefore, resource mobilization is going to be a critical factor that I think we have to think of, plan on, and ensure that there is this general harmonization in how we're looking at resource mobilization for climate change, for, um, for CMS, for BBNJ as a whole for SIDS. And again, bridging those capacity gaps that we have, there's, a, there's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done, especially on the monitoring framework um, to support the implementation of the framework. Um, so therefore, we have to make sure that we have the necessary capacities to engage with the ongoing processes that have already been started this year for us to finalize the framework. So that's a, a critical one. And then entry points for implementation. Of course, all of the parties are now going to be expected to update their national biodiversity strategy and action plans in order to uh, respond to the updated framework. And here again, there is an important um, uh, a link that we need to make with regards to the MBSAPs, the Program of Work on Island Biodiversity, and everything else that we are doing at a global scale. And finally, um, there are some other, cons other considerations that we, um, we could explore under the CBD in order for us to have a stronger voice. And uh, um, at the CBD COP15, there was the launch of the SEEDS Coalition for Nature. Um, uh, and that is one of the mechanisms I think that there is potential for us to work even closely with GLISPA to see how best to, um, to put this new structure on its feet so that it can help us to deliver on the um, global biodiversity objectives. I think I will end here and I will welcome any questions that you may have um, for me or on the, on the process on in anything else that I've touched on this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marime, for such insightful information and perspective. I now hand over to my colleague, Jabal Hassan Ali, our strategy manager, who will moderate the Q&A session. There are quite a number of questions in the chat at this time. Jabal? Thanks, Paula. Um, okay, so we have a number of questions to get to, so let's get to it. Um, I want to start with Spencer. I have two questions here. I want to know if you could take quickly. The first is from Ms. Karen Baird. Will the stock take include estimating the impact of actions taken, not just what actions have been taken? And as a follow-up on the loss and damage fund from the Bangladesh Indigenous, Indigenous Women's Network, someone wants to know how, how can persons like themselves engage with the loss and damage fund? So Spencer.
Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for, for the question. On the issue of the, the stock tick, um, of course, yes, we have the technical dialogue going on to determine the modalities of the stock tick. I believe it is important that we focus on the actions that are required, both um, qualitatively and quantitatively, and, 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 and to address it against the objectives and targets that we set. Um, it's important, of course, that the stock take was an ambition-raising mechanism, an ambition-raising mechanism, particularly for climate mitigation and climate adaptation and climate finance. So we need to measure the stock take based on the targets, quantitative and qualitative targets that we will set ourselves on, on these key major issues, including, of course, loss and damage. And, and for loss and damage, yes, I think we have to continue our advocacy on loss and damage. Um, the transition committee's work needs to be followed diligently during this, this period, because this is the work that will influence the, 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 the scope and modalities and how we're going forward with the, uh, with the loss and damage issue. But as I said in the presentation, SEEDS needs to, co to coalesce on this issue of liability and compensation, because there are several in initiatives at the moment led by some SEEDS, and that needs to be coordinated. Um, Vanuatu, I think, um, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Lucia, there are all issues relating to getting technical legal advice on how to proceed with the issue of loss and damage and the liability and compensation issue. And I think we really need to have a seeds position on several of these issues as indicated as we go forward. Thank you. Thanks, Spence. Um, Marimi, this one is for you specifically, um, also for Ms. Beard. Um, she's interested in the, the strategy review of the island biodiversity. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Who will run it and who will develop the TOR and can islands contribute? Okay, so the, the process is supposed to be starting um, this year. So based on the way the decision has been made, um, the request has been made to the executive secretary to facilitate this review. Um, so, of course, the, the most common way under CBD is that the secretariat would, would put the, um, the old program of work out and ask for comments and inputs from parties, stakeholders and other organizations. And from there, they would compile, um, they would compile all of the comments. And then from there, um, the process, of course, um, the way it's been factored into the decision is that it will be based on resources, but it's likely going to be either an expert group or um, a similar mechanism that would then work with the secretariat in, in providing some clear um, way forward on whether there will be a new program of work, whether it would be integrated into specific parts of the framework that is still to be um, to be identified. But this is the, the process that is meant to start, I believe, um, the second half of this year. So I would just say be on the lookout for the notifications when they, when they come out. Um, and if there is interest also when this process is started, I can always um, just flag GLISPA because GLISPA is a key partner and is actually part of the decision. Yeah, we, we're, um, the CBD secretariat has already talked to us about um, this and the person who will probably lead it, who heads the Marine and Coastal Work Program is on GLISPA's board. So we have a, a, a strong um, relationship on that. And I think that will be important moving forward. Um, we help the CBD with the the 2012 review and really tried to make the effort to get island import into that, um, not just small island developing states, but more broadly islands, because the program of work is um, about all islands, regardless of the political status. So it's all of the members and um, parties of the convention. And so I think it's a really great opportunity for bringing those things together. Okay. Okay, up next we have, this isn't a question, it's more a comment, it was submitted anonymously because of the sensitive nature, but I think it's, it's, it touched on something very important and needs to be said out loud, and I would love to hear the reactions of our, our panelists to this comment. It's something that Spencer spoke about in his presentation, but I think both panelists can, can, can speak on this afterwards. Um, the anonymous attendee said, the issue of maintaining the focus on the special circumstances of SIDS is very important. This was definitely challenged at CBD negotiations too, in a variety of ways. 
The CBD agreement itself described other environmentally vulnerable countries, such as arid, semi-arid, coastal, montane, basically everyone. And a number of countries were trying to push that in a bunch of different places in the negotiation, which would dilute the special place of SIDS. Any, any reaction to this? I think my, my main reaction is yes, yes, to totally agree. And I think this is uh, some of the difficulties that we, we did encounter. And I think the only place where we were able to, so we kept on referring to Article 20 of the, of the convention. And, uh, and I know we had some island, um, island countries that really, really was helping us to take it home. And I think here of Jamaica, who was really leading us on a lot of these things. So, um, we, we, we tried fighting, but again, it's, it's always limited to what is available in the text of the convention. And this, is, this has been our, our fallback. We were hoping that uh, there are other processes that's happening um, at the global level for seeds that we eventually can fall back on. But this is always going to be a, a continuous fight that we will have to continue to have over, over the COPs to come. I will agree with, with Mary on this, and also just to indicate that um, for small island developing states, the formulation is quite important. It's unique vulnerability. So we're not saying that others are not vulnerable. What we are saying is that small island states are uniquely vulnerable, and they have special circumstances. And not only special circumstances, because we are the ones that are uh, bearing the burden of the climate change, but we have the least capacity, the least capacity to react and to respond and to adapt to the climate change. So the combination of those two is unique for small island businesses. And that is the context of our, of our so we're not saying other, other regions are not vulnerable. We are not saying that. What we're saying is that we need to recognize, as is recognized in the convention, the special vulnerability and unique circumstances of small island developing states. And we need to hold on to this because this must pervade all the negotiations that we have in all other tracks, including mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, finance, capacity building, just transition. The whole the trend of these special circumstances must be incorporated in the deliberations. And as we see happening now, in terms of the reform of the, of the Bretton Woods institution, Again, we're asking for the disaster clauses to be in 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 in, in the um in 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 the loan agreements because all these things are tied to our capacity, our debt capacity, and and, and our uh, fiscal capacity. All are tied up in the whole issue of climate vulnerability, and which is significant and unique for small states. Thank you. Thank you, Spence. I believe it was under attack in the BBNJ negotiations as well. So it's on all fronts. Um, and we have a final question slash comment. This is from Marie Celine Piano. I hope I pronounced that properly. Um, do you think public awareness and support could help make things move faster? Or is it too niche and political anyway? Only a few people within the climate and ocean world know about these COPs and the CBDs. These conferences are really difficult to understand. It seems like a small and closed world from the outside. But if there's general support and pressure, maybe that could have an impact and some specialized organizations could work on this. And yeah, I, I just want to add to that because I, I had a similar question. Like I saw you spent talk about a lot of outcomes that weren't achieved, such as the 100 billion not achieved. Um, and I know from personal experience, we have some of the best negotiators in the world. So it's not, is this really a year after year, cup after cup, is this a failure of the negotiators or the failure of the process? Is, is it still fit for purpose? And what can we do? outside the negotiation process to help advance our, our goals within it? <laughs> well, this is a very <laughs> tough question, but I think I'll try to answer it this way. First of all, I think we need to take our point of departure from the science. We have just, we have just completed um, three special reports, which are all important for small states. One is specifically on 1.5, one is on oceans and the cryosphere and land. There were three special reports that were done by IPCC with some very clear messages coming out of them. Then we had the working group one, two, and three reports, again, with some very clear scientific messages coming out of those. And of course, the AR6 special report, which has just been concluded um, last week. So for us, 
why are we doing this and why, why we need to act is, is known. What we need to do is clearly known. How it, how it needs to be done is clearly known. And when it should be done is also clearly known and clearly backed by rigorous science. So the question is, what is the missing element? The missing element, of course, is the will to do the actions that are required and not to backslide on activities that we have already agreed to move forward in, especially like fossil fuel subsidies and phasing out of coal and, 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 and fossil fuel and all these issues. And I believe it requires public support, of course. And um, we see a lot of this happening in terms of putting pressure on the negotiation process to see what is happening. And as I always say, the COP27 or COP, whatever number it is, is not only negotiation that is taking place. We have to be mindful that this is only a small part of the, of the conference of parties. But that in the margins of those COP, there are significant actions that are taking place in academic world, in the private sector world, in the civil society world, in the advocacy world, in the youths and, and, and women world. A lot of things are happening that are also very important to ensure that we are on the active climate agenda. So we need to look at the totality of the, of the, of the COP, but I believe what is the missing element is the political will to take the actions which are necessary to bring us on a path which is safe for the climate. And it can be done. It has been proven to be technically feasible and it has been proven to be financially feasible. So the question here is the political will is the important. We cannot continue to look at global events and indicate that these are the things that are preventing us from taking the necessary action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Spencer. You said it was a difficult question, but you, you made it sound so easy how you answered it. Um, and thank you, Marie. Thank, thank you both our, our presenters. You all were excellent and really provided a lot of food for thoughts. Um, I know we are a bit behind, but we got through all the questions. So kudos to you all as well for that. And Paula, you can take it away to the next thank you. Thank you program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jabal, and thank, thank you, you Marie and Spencer. Um, I now hand over to Kate, who would um, give us a brief overview of the next part of this webinar. Yeah, so, <clears throat> um, th yeah, that was amazing I, um, and, and inspiring in terms of what islands are doing. I Our next part of this session is really focused on some of the implementation examples. So, as I said in the start, we were really founded to focus on fostering implementation and supporting implementation of, um, in particular, the Convention on Biodiversity. And so we got um, some excellent speakers today who are either members, well, they're all members of GLISPA, but we're also at different in different ways working with them on um, various of these projects. Uh, and so without further ado, I will ask um, Paula to introduce our first speaker so we can hear some of the ways um, the implementation of what we've been talking about there is happening in an island context. Thank you, Kate. We'll now hear from Rocky Tiruna, the Global Director of Rare Fish Forever Coastal Fisheries Project. Due to the time zone difference, Rocky is unable to join us live. Um, so she has done a, a pre-recorded video. Um, but we also have a colleague, Fred, Frederick Stapp, who will be able to assist us with questions, um, with answers um, during the final Q&A. Um, I'll now play um, Rocky's um, recording. Good day, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about our project, Fishing for Climate Resilience. My name is Rocky sanchez Tirana from RARE. Fishing for Climate Resilience is an initiative of RARE's Fish Forever program, which has been working to mainstream ecosystem-based approaches into the small-scale fisheries sector as a pathway for implementing and enhancing countries' NDCs and national adaptation plans. Fishing for Climate Resilience is being implemented across 36 partner communities and local government units across the Philippines, Indonesia, Palau, and the Federated States of Micronesia. Our partners include GLISPA, MCT, the UNFAO, and the BMUV. We had five key goals for this project. First is to increase adaptive capacity of vulnerable fishers for at least 24,000 beneficiaries. Second is to strengthen governance and climate change readiness at local and provincial levels, including the inclusion of EBA in over 40 policy instruments or frameworks. 
Third is to establish cross-sectoral and peer-to-peer -peer learning to scale the initiative across 36 local governments, increasing the capacity of small-scale fishers. Fourth is to pilot initiatives that contribute to green recovery measures and strategies by enhancing the resilience of 15 micro-enterprises and linking to green recovery efforts and strategies. And then finally, it's to create political, local, and global leadership for EBA in small-scale fisheries by convening learning events and sharing insights with government and CSO partners. A key element of this approach is called Managed Access and Preserves, a fisheries management system that pairs sustainable use and protection of coastal waters so that it benefits both people and nature. Um, so in this system, you have reserves where no fishing takes place, and then you have areas where sustainable fishing practices are allowed for certain groups of people. And the communities get to co-manage these, these areas in return for setting aside the reserves. After four years of implementation, these are some of our preliminary results. 393 communities are now engaged and actively implementing EBA measures. 2,500 square kilometers of coastal waters have been protected under community co-management, including 30.85 square kilometers of blue carbon ecosystems. Eight communities have already passed climate smart resource management action plans, and, ad and an additional 26 um, are expected to follow soon. The project has also uh, benefited 20,072 direct beneficiaries, 47% of whom are women, and a total of 37,965 have been reached by behavior adoption campaigns. Now I'd like to share some of the key lessons we've learned and the drivers of success. The first lesson is about the importance of taking a holistic approach. In this project, we thought about resilience in three dimensions environmental, social, and economic, and we realized that in order to get communities to even consider EVA measures, we needed to focus on generating benefits not just for nature, but also for people. We saw that outreach regarding benefits of local EBA encountering future climate change impacts and at a scale larger than local can be difficult. Instead, a narrative which includes more immediate benefits from formally recognized territorial rights and inclusion in village, municipal, or district level decision-making processes appears to be a strong motivator for the initial adoption of measures. We also needed to create focus on creating evidence of direct benefits early in the project and to accelerate the mainstreaming of EBA in local decrees and regional policies relevant to small-scale fisheries. But to enjoy the long-term benefits, however, compliance with EBA measures that will deliver ecosystem resilience is needed. The likelihood of the MA plus R as an EBA measure to be sustained also depends on other vulnerabilities being addressed through economic, policy, and social interventions. It's relevant to consider that without these, the tendency for non-compliance with the managed access and reserve provisions during a crisis will be high. Also, to create conditions for compliance, Traditional and customary management practices can be merged with formal regulatory frameworks to result in exclusive access rights. As this underpins economic stability of small-scale fishery actors, motivations for local adoption of EVA measures will be higher. However, as many ecosystems and fish stocks require, require time to recover from human-related threats, the quality of the design of the EVA measures is critical for delivery of intended resilience and other benefits. With access to fisheries resources being open to anyone, sustainability of the solution requires attention. Actors must stay the course, and other communities must respect the new measures and adopt similar interventions. Holistic approaches require adequate skills in motivating behavior change of different types of actors. Increasing the adaptive capacity across all levels is required in order to achieve success in dealing with a changing environment. So both fisheries mismanagement and climate change are threats that need to be addressed by many different institutions and sectors. And therefore, scaling of the project impacts will require the engagement of new or additional decision makers. And this calls for the acceleration of knowledge about the value of behavioral change science for a wider range of users so that they can reach um, many different actors. Also, social capital in remote coastal communities may be strong within the community, but weak environmental governance and the lack of that social capital extending outside of the community can reduce long-term success. 
the fish populations themselves must remain healthy in order to provide long-term benefits to small-scale fishing communities. But with access to the resources being open to anyone, sustainability is really a concern. And therefore, com competition with larger fleets targeting similar stocks can re limit resources available to small-scale fisheries. Therefore, this calls for the consideration of the value of EBA measures at larger geographic scales. Next is about the importance of getting community-led conservation right. A focus on equity and inclusion is critical. One way to do this is by creating opportunities for women to share insights both into their family household finance for fishing-related decision-making and at the same time participating in fishery management bodies. Our experience here underlines the relevance of empowerment and inclusion strategies to motivate collaborative stewardship. Currently, however, local gender and cultural norms dictate the level and type of women's involvement since male involvement within the fishery is more common in rural villages. Gender transformative interventions must be designed to enhance participation of women in decision making and increase their agency within households and the community. Coordinating through existing social structures or the creation of savings groups was well regarded by the communities throughout the region. Next, we saw that approaches that build on trust, which is already existing or easily created, are most, most likely to succeed. The project confirmed that key actors in Indonesia and the Philippines are open to collaborating with NGOs on environmental issues, especially when this contributes to addressing barriers faced by small-scale elements of the sector responsible for food security. For other project countries, um, FSM and Palau, Impacts of the pandemic and other factors such as political transitions and cultural sensitivities related to obtaining project approvals from administrative and cultural leaders caused some delays in visible progress. Now that conducive conditions exist in all project countries, the model presents effective pathways to accelerating impact and also for considering other types of ecosystems that are important for the small-scale fisheries sector, such as areas where small pelagics are more prevalent. We also learned a lot in terms of thinking about microenterprises, EBA, and their access to formal financial services. Small-scale fisheries are important to rural coastal communities since many of these communities lack employment diversity. Most of the workforce is really involved in fishing or post-fishing employment. Access to financial services for these microenterprises led by the members of these communities um, that adopt EBA measures opens opportunities to grow sustainably and retain economic resilience. Further, skills and knowledge at the household level varies with the size of the family unit, level of education, and leadership ability. Not only do these factors determine the quality and quantity of the available workforce, but they're also relevant to achieving sustainable livelihoods. The project used participatory capacity development Method methodologies and locally situated project facilitators. The results illustrate that joint decision making and benefit sharing across households by, for example, establishing livelihood groups empowers communities even when initial skill levels may be low. Also, enhancing skills of individual local government leaders was a strong motivator for them to guide and support behavior changes towards the adoption of EBA measures for these microenterprises. What are the next steps for RARE? The first one is really thinking more deeply about the pathway to scale. Uh, we really want to be able to make sure that the model and the application of behavioral science um, in, in, in small-scale fisheries is something that more people have capacity to, to be able to do. Second is really to expand the work on solutions that connect ecosystems for reduced vulnerability and in a way that's really relevant to the small-scale fisheries sector. Third, it's about empowering local leaders, such as coastal mayors, through the Coastal 500 Network, not only to be heard in sub-national and national policy, but also to actively participate at the global, global level in relevant processes, such as the UNFCCC and the UNCBD. And then finally, it's to increase the adoption of the project's insights into policy and in the design of public and private investments in climate adaptation projects. It is in this spirit that I'm very excited to today launch the Fishing for Climate Resilience Impact and Lessons Learned report that's now available on our website for downloading.
Thank you very much for your attention today. Um, and my colleague, Freddie, will be um, available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Rocky and Freddie. Um, um, the link to the report will be posted in the chat, and it will also be part of our follow-up um, communications following this webinar. Um, as Rocky had mentioned, GLISPA was one of the project partners on the, this project. And one of the main lessons emanating from our work was that the importance was the importance of political leadership in our adaptation measures and the building of resiliency. Um, we'd now introduce Maya Imeris Daldu, um, who is a regional officer for Pacific and Francophonia Flu Nature Alliance, who actually is going to speak a little bit about um, our work regarding um, political uncertainty of large scale ocean conservation efforts. Mile, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Paula. Um, good day, everyone, uh, fellow panelists, and thanks uh, the GLISPA team for hosting us today. Um, so, yes, I'm working with the Blue Nature Alliance, which, uh, if you don't know, uh, we are we are a financial and technical partner that aim at catalyzing ocean conservation at scale through creation of uh, protected areas and conservation areas or improving management effectiveness of existing ones. So we work with countries and local partners to advance um, that goal. And what I'm about to bring to your attention today is clearly an ongoing conversation, a very open one. That's the reason why I don't have any presentation or PowerPoint is because we want to talk about that. Uh, and we are clearly on a long curve um, and have some work in progress to honestly get a better grasp on weathering political uncertainty. Um, so let's take a step back. and. Over the past few decades, and in response to raising you know, global concerns about the health of the ocean, our large-scale marine protected areas or large-scale conservation projects at the local, national, and international level have bloomed. Um, and the latest COP15 on the biodiversity ended with the adoption of the Cunning Montreal Global uh, Biodiversity Framework, which includes the 30 by 30 goal, protecting 30% of the planet by 2030, um, which should give another boost to the expansion of large-scale NPAs. Uh, with more countries committed. So maybe maybe first thing first, let's impact a little bit what we what what commitment applies. Um and, and as you know, nowadays most of the political commitments are made at the at the range of international fora. Um and committing to large scale ocean conservation implies a long list of functional and structural reforms together with a series of programmatic activities that can impact uh, the country's sovereignty its policy framework, its public finances, and its institutional organization. So moving from forward from an announcement to the legal establishment is often a journey that can take a few years. Um, and it will usually take another couple of years before a site reaches the appropriate level of capacities, resources to operate at an optimum level and demonstrate management effectiveness because that's what we want at the end of the day, something that is working. Um, and this requires a huge investment of resource, people, and time. So once established, it is usually accepted that large-scale conservation areas will operate in perpetuity, though conservation history have demonstrated that it's not the case uh, and that efforts have to be continuously sustained over time uh, at several levels with different players uh, to guarantee that durability. Um, and I'm talking about large-scale conservation areas, but also large-scale ocean conservation project and any conservation project, actually. Um, so through its life, uh, a large-scale conservation site will be managed and governed through successive ministers and national leaders. And it will be subject subjected to changing setup in the legislative and executive power balance. That is perhaps, apart from the ocean, <laughs> one of the most common variables amongst a conservation project. Yet it is hardly discussed. And I guess it's about time that we really uh, talk about the elephant in the room, talk about weathering through political changes. Um, and sharing a little bit of my experience, I'm uh, from New Caledonia, which is that small island over there, French territory uh, in the South Pacific. Uh, in the last 15 years, since 2007, we had seven presidents leading 13 governments. So if you do the math, it's like one government every year and a half. Every time same things happen, country holds its breath, stop moving, budgets are frozen, public services are minimum services, there's clearly no new initiatives, and everybody is preparing to meet with a new leadership and trying to defend, you know, ongoing projects or new projects 
So I'm pretty sure this sounds familiar to you, and I'm pretty sure you can relate. Um, so sharing a little bit of the experience on the field, one one project that we have with the Brunet Alliance is working in New Caledonia, my home island, with um, customary authorities, customary senate, which is an official institution of the country, and customary districts in support of the natural park of the Coral Sea. And it applies reforming some of the law to incorporate the kind of cultural vision of the ocean and support the leadership of the park governance. Since we started the discussion at the end of 2022, uh, 2021, I mean, we went under two governments and three ministers in charge of the park of the Coral Sea. So as you can expect, this has a huge impact on how we navigate and, 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 and implement the strategy that we have to, to get to the end result. Another example is in the Seychelles, where uh, uh, we partner with Stekat Marme here presenting today, and the government um, of Seychelles in Ministry of uh, Environment. And we work on the rebel finance and the governance structure of the national network of MPA, uh, which include the establishment of a government, governing agency. And this is typically a structural, structural reform uh, of governance that requires the government way in. And as we started implementing, um, a new president and government was elected um, and forces to change a little bit the strategy because vision was slightly different and, and priorities as well which is not a big problem, but still it needs to uh, adjust uh, course correct. And, and something that was planned to be implemented two years ago is still in the making. And that's all right, because again, large scale ocean conservation is a journey, but a journey through which we need to adjust um, uh, accordingly to these um, political changes. So do that just two quick example of about 25 sites that we have across the, the world. And quite frankly, political changes is one of the few things that has the power to really shake one way or the other um, a large scale ocean conservation initiative. But it's very much a reality. It happens quite often. It's predictable. It's going to happen every couple of years, uh, most of the time in most of the countries. And we need to be better prepared, actually, to weather through and mitigate this political uncertainty if we are to build durable conservation efforts and succeed in our shared goal of 30%. Uh, of the power planet protected. So let's talk about it. Um, the implications of changes in governments and the insistent perspective of new political leaders on the legacy of marine conservation cannot be understated. And we have a few questions. How best do we anticipate a change of leadership and prepare succession? How best do we adjust government reforms with the requirement of a large scale marine protective area? And how do we embed the legacy of conservation in a renewed political vision? Uh, Clearly, the perspective of that matter would be quite different if you're a leader, a former leader or a new leader. If you're a public servant, a manager, if you're working with partners, conservation, um, um, NGOs and others. So clearly, this is a matter at all levels that we need to yeah, understand and be, and be better at, at navigating through. Um, so back to the Alliance and a little bit sharing a little bit of the experience and how we try to tackle that. Uh, there is two ways the Alliance work for ocean conservation. One is on sites uh, supports, and the other one is growing the field and trying to understand different aspects of ocean conservation. So when it comes to site support, first of all, in practice, we work with local partners in places uh, where there is at the very least a political will to start with as a way to also get a better understanding and, 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 and well, re really anchor project in, in countries and, and see things are coming. So we build in some good flexibility in the framework of our partnership, because as I say, we need to course correct uh, along the, the, the course of the partnerships. And um, we may then open a regular com uh, communication so you can be aware, anticipate and adapt to these political changes. Uh, we try to focus throughout our engagements on core elements of a functioning uh, large scale conservation project that su supports durability. So thinking about durability very early on in the project is critical because we want to make sure that there is some long lasting impact and that we are able to, to uh, go through new challenges. Uh, and related to the topic of political changes, but among other capacities, we do work with governments and public servants who most often are the carrier of institutional and technical knowledge. Uh, we foster advocacy and public support because the custom constituency is important, the voters, people who vote are the one who influences uh, politics. So working with the public um, is, is, is critical and anchor the legacy of a society in its cultural context. 
uh, we support reforms of legal framework, which depending on the level where the reform happens, um, prevent or make it difficult any rollback. Um, we also work and encourage political leaders in their vision for oceans, including parliamentarians who are also at the level where they can keep new governments accountable to some extent. Um, sustainable finance or durable finance, financial autonomy is a critical one because the economical benefits and the pressure released from public funding is usually a good incentive for leaders to continue to carry on the project. Uh, and maybe for more personal reflection, it's also about contributing to a cultural shift, you know, um, particularly at the political level, about considering the ocean as a central piece for countries' durability, sustainability, and development. Um, and maybe to, to, to conclude, there is another part, another way uh, we work, and it's uh, through partnerships with PSPA and others like Big Ocean, on, on that growing the field question and, and, and thinking through, you know, how we can have bigger impact. And so, they, this conversation of political uncertainty started like two years ago, I think with Kate and, and other friends. And um, we started to bring that conversation out there uh, with the help of GLISPA, the Big Ocean Network, to explore those questions through a series of dialogue. And I'm going to put that in the chat. There is two webinars that you can find on YouTube that was hosted by uh, GLISPA here. Um, and then we had a series of other dialogues, you know, at the United Nation at the Impact Five. Um, and involving leaders, ministers from uh, different places, Virgin Islands, Bahamas, uh, French Polynesia, Guam, um, conservation practitioners, um, managers, uh, managers from across the globe, uh, including Rapa Nui, Chile, Canada, Argentina, and others. So we really want to have that dialogue out there, have that conversation ongoing, because we definitely want to keep learning. Um, and I want to pull you the takeaways from uh, from 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 those uh, dialogue. I really encourage you if you have an hour and a half, just you want to listen and, and learn. There is a really interesting insights and takeaway again, depending on whether we talk with a leader or a set managers. And so we will continue to do that. And what I would like to do to do now is encourage you to come forward. There are many lessons to learn out there. Sometimes they have way. And we really want to hear from you. We really we need to understand different perspectives. And perhaps we also need to understand what to do with it. <laughs> Once we gather that knowledge, what do we do with it? So I'll probably stop here. It must be 10 minutes. But uh, that's, again, a very interesting and important conversation. And so I'm really keen on continuing to have that conversation with you. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Maya. We'll now have our final speaker, um, Andreas Hansen, the Senior Policy Advisor on Conservation Finance Policy with the Nature Conservancy. He will speak to us a bit about TNC's debt conversion initiatives. Andreas? Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll get started. You can see that all right. And first of all, just yes. thank you so much for inviting me to join and to speak of the Nature Conservancy's work on debt conversions or blue bonds for ocean conservation, as we've called them to date. And in many ways, that's um, a return to the topic of blue bonds in the context of GLISPA, as the partnership was very much there and present uh, as part of facilitating the first of these kind of projects in the Seychelles quite a few years back now. And um, we very much uh, want to continue that collaboration as we all work together to implement the outcomes of the climate and biodiversity COPs that our first two speakers mentioned already. And actually some of the other panelists, um, it's great to be in the company of so many panelists because we really need a, uh, a whole set of solutions. There's no silver bullet here. And so I'm sharing, sharing one solution and there's Quite a few other complementary solutions and as you will have already gathered there's also um, many colleagues who are already working um, in in this space and in, from the Seychelles we've, we've got Murray May here from SACAP one of the key outcomes actually of, of the Blue Bonds um, for Conservation project there so it's great to see um, this kind of collaboration going forward so um, our Blue Bonds program came kind of out of three key insights. Um, the first one being that 
as you all know, um, oceans are incredibly critical to our well-being. Two, that they are in peril from a whole range of pressures. And three, that there are significant barriers to change that have been highlighted. And some of the ones that we've seen time and time again is that there is just unsustainable ocean use that creates these pressures on the ocean, that there's a lack of follow through from commitment to implementation and that there is insufficient funding allocated for the ocean. I think we're all familiar with the fact that this is one of the least funded SDGs overall SDG 14. And so the Blue Bond for Conservation strategy is an attempt to try to address some of these barriers to allow ocean conservation and sustainable use to happen and to be taken forward. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that model means, but really quite centrally is this um, ambition of a country to want to conserve, protect and sustainably manage its ocean. And that is where we kind of find uh, a common ambition, a common ground, and then collaborate to bring that to life. So um, a country has, has, has an ambition that is developed through a set of conservation commitments. Um, and then the Nature Conservancy supports the implementation of those commitments, both through the development of sustainable finance mechanisms, through debt um, refinancing mechanism, through providing technical assistance for the planning for implementation, for instance, the Marine Spatial Plan, and through the establishment of a mechanism, most commonly a conservation fund, and take up being one key example of a very successful one, um, that can uh, manage the, the revenues generated through um, the debt conversion and put them towards the implementation of, of the uh, conservation commitments that are part of, of this project. And fundamentally, the financial aspect here is that many countries, of course, have heavy debt burdens, and sometimes it's possible to replace uh, part of that debt burden with a lighter debt burden that then creates fiscal savings and fiscal space for investment in conservation. Um, so there are a whole range of enabling factors that play a role in terms of whether this is the right solution for, for a country to take forward. As I mentioned, it really starts with this ambition to want to sustainably manage, protect and conserve the ocean. But then there's also other enabling factors such as good internal government coordination. These projects tend to require the cooperation of the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Environment, Ministry responsible for fisheries. And that is really important in terms of the long-term viability of these projects is that internal government cooperation and shared ambition. It's also critical that there is a space for stakeholders, ocean users, um, to participate in the planning process and own part of the implementation process and the benefits deriving from that. So that is something else we look at. We also need to make sure that there are actually debt and market conditions that create the potential for financial savings. And that will be a combination of what debt a country holds, what prices that is uh, trading at at the international market and whether it can be replaced by cheaper debt that can um, really create those savings that are necessary to create the financial flows towards conservation. And finally, as I mentioned, it's important to have an independent conservation fund to um, channel and implement that funding that is being created. So to date, we've developed or deployed this, this strategy in three places in cooperation with governments and, and other partners. And the first one, um, really, um, the first time this was, was done at a large scale and um, ocean debt conversion was in, in Seychelles. And there it resulted in a 21.6 million refinancing of foreign official debt. Um, you can see here there were some pretty substantial commitments and, and achievements that were uh, achieved through this. Um, there was a very comprehensive and inclusive marine special planning process which in part increased the area of protection from 
0.04% of the exclusive economic zone to 30%. And an important outcome um, was also the establishment of, of SACAT. And you've just heard Marie May say earlier, I think that um, just recently they've, they've um, launched um, a new announcement of, of new projects that have been funded through, through SACAT grant funding. Um, so definitely check out that. It's an incredible, incredible institution. Um, and within the marine protection, just to highlight, this includes levels of protection. There are some highly protected areas, but there are also those which allow for sustainable use that is compatible with the biodiversity outcomes that these areas are being designed for. The second project we did was in Belize um, in 2021, and this was really focusing at um, refinancing uh, a big chunk of commercial debt, again, focused on increasing protection through a marine spatial planning process, but there were also additional commitments that the government was keen to work on around blue carbon, as well as um, governance around domestic and high seas fisheries. Um, as you can see here, there's again an annual funding flow that is derived from, from the debt conversion. And also importantly, in this case, um, a sum of money that was put into an endowment that will hopefully grow over the years, so that when this particular debt project comes to an end uh, after 20 years, there then should be further funding available that will continue a sustainable funding flow following that. And then the final project we've done quite recently uh, was in Barbados, where the Nature Conservancy worked together with the Inter-American Development Bank to co-guarantee a 150 million US dollar sovereign bond that the government issued to buy back expensive debt and thereby unlock 50 million US dollars for marine conservation over the next 15 years. And you will see here that the commitments are relatively similar to, to the previous ones. Um, the last thing I want to say is that we've now done three of these projects. They're by no means final or finished. Um, as you can see, the timelines for implementation was anything from 15 to 20 years. So these are really long term projects reflecting the fact that to achieve durable change, you need to be there in the long term and the finance mechanisms need to reflect that too. Um, but with those three projects at least having gotten to financial close and starting in the planning project, we've also looked at whether we can now use this strategy more broadly. So our initial phase was focused on ocean and that's the name blue bonds. We're now moving to calling um, the strategy as a whole nature bonds so that we also can deploy the strategy in areas where there might be an interest in mixing um, both terrestrial, marine and freshwater outcomes, or focus more on any one of those three, or indeed focus on projects that are more climate heavy maybe than biodiversity heavy. Of course, climate and biodiversity go hand in hand, and a lot of the work that has happened in the ocean space is also climate resilience and climate sequestration work. Um, but this is really to broaden the, the areas in which we are able to use those strategies. I'll stop there so we at least have a little bit of time for questions. Um, but thank you so much again for, for inviting us and, and allowing us to give a quick introduction to that work. And of course, very happy to follow up um, after this with questions um, either to me, uh, and I'll put my email in the chat, or to Melissa Puppy, who's our Global Director for Ocean Protection. Thank you so much, Andreas. Um, we now open the floor. Is, are there any questions? If so, can you please place into the chat or the Q&A section? I've not seen any. Anybody has a question? I have a question. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, yes, please. And handily, I have the microphone, so it's also helpful. Um, so I wanted to ask all three of you. So we heard um, the issue around urgency coming out of the, uh, the first um, two speakers the kind of scale, a whole bunch of things. How, where do you see, like bearing all those things in mind, where do you see the different efforts you're doing go, work going to next? Has anything you've heard um, or 
kind of engaged with over the last year and some of these um, discussions kind of um, given you pause to think about how um, both how we work together collectively to increase our impact but also what how that impacts what you're doing um, as you're as you move forward with both these specific projects but other potential ones it's an easy question maybe um, yeah go for it so um thank you kate and again also thank you for the invitation um just for presenting uh vice president for fish forever here rocky that you um a moment ago saw on the screen um, so obviously it's a, it's a big question. I um, I'm particularly astonished by how complementary the different um, activities and different initiatives that we heard here about today are actually. So for instance, we had Andreas talk about innovative financing, Mal very much talking about the role of government. And what we are doing is really focusing on the local level, building the capacity so that basically um, funding can be turned into effective management. So um, what we are really going to do is use the lessons learned that were just recently presented um, to share mostly with our Coastal 500 network, which is um, the world's first network of coastal mayors um, around the globe committed to thriving climate resilience coastal communities. And we do that because we strongly believe and know by now also that um, local governments and local mayor specifically as the node between local communities and higher level government play a significant role in actually making sure that the local communities are involved in processes that concern their natural resources and their own livelihoods. So in terms of agency, they have a really important role. But at the same time, they also have the ability to actually speak to the higher level government and get engaged in different processes such as the UNCBD and the UNFCCC processes. So most of our work we're really focusing on uh, further building the capacity of these government partners and um, making sure that they do get visibility and agency in uh, policy processes and financing um, mechanisms that really concern their coastal fisheries. I'll stop here. Thank you, Freddie. Andreas, Miles? I can add briefly, I think for me, it's just learning time and time again that there isn't a silver bullet. And really what we need to convey to going together is that it's it's a holistic approach and not selling anything as this is, this is the one solution. Um, it's a combination of management, of planning, of protection, but it's also about tackling climate change and biodiversity loss at the same time. And that in some ways can sound overwhelming, but at the same time, there is a whole plethora of allies of organizations that know really great stuff in these areas and collaborating very openly with as many people as possible, I think is really the key to success. And many of these Blue Bonds projects, you know, it's not like it's the Nature Conservancy by itself, it's the Nature Conservancy together with the Inter-American Development Bank, together with national and local government and stakeholders really implementing these things on the ground. And I think really owning that, that collaboration um, is, is something that just is going to get us where we need to be um, in the next few, few years. Thank you, Andreas. We actually have two questions that I directed to you. The first one is from Engel. It says financially, how does the bonds work? Is it a loan, a grant? I'm not a finance person and I need your enlightenment. The other one is from Karen. Um, love the idea of assisting countries to refinance for conservation. Has CNC or are you working in any Pacific countries? So the first one, it, it's not a grant. Um, it can be a loan or it can be a bond. And I won't go into the details of all of those differences, but essentially it is it is a commercial vehicle, um, there will still be something to repay, whether that is a loan to someone or, or a bond that bondholders are investing into. But by combining a traditional instrument like a loan or a bond with conservation commitments and sometimes risk enhancement mechanisms, so for instance, in Belize, the um, Development Finance Institution of the US provided political risk insurance, which means that 
investors think that it's less likely that that loan isn't going to be paid back. Um, in Barbados, with a cloud guarantee between TNC and the Inter-American Development Bank, again, investors were more confident that that money would come back. You get better rates. And so you can take something uh, where a government was paying a high interest rates or had to repay very quickly and replace that with something where there is a lower interest rate on the repayment or where the repayment can be done over a longer time period, which creates more risk. So it's not a grant, but it is a way of refinancing existing debt to better terms. Many people maybe might think of it as remortgaging a house. Um, if you renegotiate the mortgage to better conditions, you create more room to spend on other things that might be important in, in your personal finances. And it's in many ways, the same thing here, trying to get rid of overly burdensome debt with something that is better, less expensive, and directing the savings towards really key investments in um, ocean conservation and natural um, yeah, nature-based solutions. And then the second question was um, whether we're working in the Pacific um, with the Blue Bonds project. Not right now. Um, we are working in the Pacific more broadly. Um, and to some extent, we keep reviewing um, the geographies where we think this is possible and potentially even with the expansion to, to nature bonds that might be more possible again. Um, one of the key factors, as I mentioned in the enabling conditions, is that there is suitable debt to refinance and that is sometimes a limiting factor. Um, but as I said, we keep reviewing and I think it was my who said we're also very <laughs> open to people approaching us and saying, hey, have you actually looked at this properly? Um, and we'd love to hear from from, from colleagues and stakeholders who uh, may have ideas of where else this, this could work. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are now out of time. And so I would like to say a very special thank you to all our presenters and to you, the participants. Um, I'll just hand over to Kate for closing remarks. Um, well, my main closing remarks is what a wonderful um, group of speakers. It's very inspiring, both um, in terms of the projects and they, these are in multiple locations, lots of islands being um, engaged and impacted. And I really want to thank Spencer and Marie May for putting us in context with kind of the broader global policy space that all of the work that we're doing um, sits within. And um, moving forward, I hope that we can um, talk about some of these issues more and the input into some of the preparations, particularly on um, where we have um, the ability to input into that. I want to thank all of the um, participants for staying online and thanking Paula for a um, great organization of this webinar. Thank you.